marijuana was not part of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I think in many ways had bought into the narrative and the stereotypes. And so as a mother of teens now, I was looking around and seeing that cannabis seems to be everywhere and people like Martha Stewart. And, you know, I mean, it was amazing to me just how mainstream it had suddenly become. And I wanted to understand why. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Different Leaf. I'm Britt Smith in full recovery mode from the last four years and ready for a new chapter, which will hopefully include delivery cannabis in Massachusetts. More on that after today's interview. Like a lot of you last Wednesday, I toasted a full pipe to our new administration. And as I inhaled, you know what I thought? I thought to myself, I'm old enough to remember that it wasn't always this easy to celebrate democracy with weed. You know, we didn't even have adult use pot shops in Massachusetts for the 2016 inauguration, when many of us could have done with it the most. In fact, just a decade ago, recreational weed shops in the US weren't even a thing. The first 21 and up marijuana shops opened in Oregon and Washington in 2012. Before that, people were just buying and selling illegally, risking serious jail time in most states. And they certainly weren't purchasing it for special occasions like I did on January 19th. In fact, I remember when people didn't even want to discuss marijuana in public back in the day. So how is it that we've gone from marijuana being this taboo topic about seedy underground gateway drugs that are sold illegally to being sold luxurious cannabis-infused product lines developed by top scientists and promoted by our most trusted celebrities over just the span of a few years? Today, we're going to talk about the amazing PR job that has been done on cannabis in North America. My guest this week is Heather Cabot, an award-winning journalist and former ABC News correspondent and anchor who recently released her second book, The New Chardonnay, the unlikely story of how marijuana went mainstream. She tells us what it was like to follow some of the first people to dive into the risky and uncharted territory of selling cannabis above ground when it was still federally illegal. And how the image of cannabis has been revamped to the point that many of us can now see it as our go-to intoxicant after a long, hard day of work. Hi, Heather Cabot. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you? How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Very Um, nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you too. So I, I dug into your book, The New Chardonnay, the unlikely story of how marijuana went mainstream over the new year. And uh, it was honestly a little, a nice little refresher from what the rest of the world was seeing during the new year. So thanks for that. Um, Your background is not anything to do with marijuana. Is that right? No, no, I'm a journalist. You're not a marijuana reporter at all. You didn't follow alcohol. How, how is it that you got so interested in the story of marijuana legalization? Well, I was just really interested in the people and the people behind the industry. I just thought there were some really compelling characters. And I also, you know, as I mentioned in the introduction of the book, I grew up in the Just Say No 80s. And uh, that part of my life, you know, is sort of the way I still am today. I mean, I was, I, marijuana was not part of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I think in many ways had bought into the narrative and the stereotypes. And so as a mother of teens now, I was looking around and seeing that cannabis seems to be everywhere and people like Martha Stewart. And, you know, I mean, it was amazing to me just how mainstream it had suddenly become. And I wanted to understand why. And I mean, the way I got interested in it really was my first book, Geek Girl Rising, Inside the Sisterhood Shaking Up Tech. It was about the women advocating for a seat at the table in Silicon Valley. And part of the reporting that I did on that was about women who were investing in other women. Mm -hmm. And I noticed um, that some of those women were starting to invest in cannabis. And I didn't understand why Mm -hmm. I hadn't followed it. I didn't know what a big business it was becoming. And so I just started working the phones and I started asking them, why would you be involved in something that's still federally illegal? Like, what's the opportunity here? Isn't there a lot of risk? Yeah. And they said, there's a much bigger story here than you realize that if you really want to understand what's happening, you need to go to the marijuana business convention in Las Vegas. And mm-hmm. that's what I did. And that, that sort of set me off on this odyssey. 
I was kind of the same way when I joined um, the the media. I um, when I first got out of college and I first got into the newsroom, nobody was really aware of how big cannabis industry was going to be. So I moved from California, where I studied at UC Berkeley, where it was already recreationally legal, and I came over to Massachusetts in 2017, just as it was starting to legalize. And I tried to tell people, you know, I was in the CBS building, and I was like, "Do you guys have like?" a beat on the marijuana sort of industry here. And they were like, no, why would we? And I was like, the Boston Globe has like a a whole team just for, for this industry. Like it's, it's going to create jobs. It's going to change healthcare. It's going to change the way we socialize. I was astounded that the news didn't sort of have much of a, a finger on the pulse of this story. But you said that, you know, you were drawn into the characters. How is it that you chose the characters that you chose for your book? Because there's a lot of characters that are going on in the world of weed. But, you know, the people that you focused on, um, Beth Stavola, uh, Snoop Dogg and his business partner. How did you choose these characters? So, yes, this is a book about cannabis, but it's also about these intrepid entrepreneurs. It's about these people who have such a passion for what they're doing that they're willing to risk it all. And so I was looking for people who, um, first of all, would allow me to follow them, number one, and be a fly on the wall in their worlds. Um, But also um, people that had something about their backstory, something about their passion that anybody could relate to. Just aspects of their lives that would be universally interesting. You do talk about the former Canopy Growth CEO, Bruce Linton, but you know, the person I really want to know more about is Beth Stavola, the so-called queen of marijuana. What can you tell me about Beth? Beth, I think, is such an amazing character for so many reasons. I mean, not the least of which is that she's a mother of six who got into this industry because she had really taken some time off and actually stepped away from a job she loved on Wall Street that she was good at um, because her husband was pressuring her to spend more time at home. And her foray into cannabis in many ways was a story of redemption. This was, this was her way to get, you know, she, she hated being at home. She loved being with her kids, but she really missed her using her professional skills. And for her, this was a way to sort of get back to what she loved, which is business. And I felt like there were a lot of people out there that would relate to that story of somebody who, you know, stayed at home for a couple of years and was now trying to fight her way back in and and fight for credibility in this incredibly male dominated industry where she was not taken seriously at all. I see that you kind of like the passion behind the characters, you know, like uh, what was it like to be a fly on the wall with her? It sounded like a kind of a, a crazy few years. It was, but, you know, it took a really long time. You know, she, like most of these characters in the book, and frankly, anybody in cannabis, I mean, everybody knows everybody. It's a very insular world. And particularly years that she was doing this in 2012, 2013, when she was starting out, she couldn't tell anybody really what she was doing. And so the people around her were very protective of her. And it took me quite a while to convince them to trust me Mm. um, and to allow me to have the access that I needed to have to be able to tell the story the way I wanted. I got connected to her because I was doing some freelance writing for Forbes. Mm -hmm. And one of her investors overheard me interviewing someone about being a woman in the business. And he pulled me aside and he said, if you're writing about women in the space, you've got to, you got to meet best of all. So he ultimately connected us and we talked on the phone and she invited me down to the Jersey shore to her family compound. And I spent a day with her and her sister and her head of sales and the women who, you know, were the executives in her company that were her former nannies and, you know, this really tight group of women. And they were sizing me up the entire time. I could, <laughs> I could tell. I mean, they were like, hmm, you know, is this the real deal? She took a delegation of New Jersey lawmakers on a junket to Las Vegas when they were first starting to decide what was going to happen in New Jersey with legalization. And she showed them her grow operation. And they had a whole summit where New Jersey officials met Nevada officials including law enforcement, um, to talk about what it, what it would look like in New Jersey if, if this industry was to, to come, um, you know, for adult use. Yeah. So I flew there to meet her and, again, you know, sort of spent a lot of time schmoozing with her people and, and getting them to, you know, hel- helping them get to know me and sort of what my uh, ambitions were for the project. 
And it it's kind of sounded like a lot of her background was, you know, working with shady people in the beginning because it really was coming into legalization. The, the meeting of millionaires who had the capital to invest in criminals who knew how to grow. And so it's kind of the weird meshing of these two worlds where you talk a lot about how they had to come together with police officers and um, former felons who'd been incarcerated for these kinds of offenses. It took these people to be trusted by both sides of the equation to change the culture around like the taboo was the thing I found the most fascinating to change the culture around how we talk about weed now and how, um, you know, how women who are successful entrepreneurs are now acceptable in the world of marijuana. And it's no longer like a shady underground business. And, you know, there was so much cultural normalization that that happened over those years. And you, and you sort of, you were a fly on the wall to watch all of these amazing stories the cultural image has changed from stoner to like almost like a luxury and a medicine. What was the main components that you saw drove the industry from being something underground to something being acceptable now? Well, I think people like Beth, people like Bruce Linton, I think people coming in from other industries who really had the business expertise and frankly were looking at it as a, as an opportunity to cash in. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think when you look at how quickly the industry has become professionalized and legitimized, a lot of that has to do with people coming in with very serious business backgrounds and doing exactly what Beth and Bruce did, which was sort of figuring out who from um, the illicit market they could trust And I think also from a policy point of view and a political point of view, I think that the predictions about crime spiking kids, you know, suddenly a huge numbers of kids suddenly using weed, all kinds of the the, the, um, predictions that people made about the sky falling in the early days did not come to pass. Not that there had not been bumps along the way. And certainly, as we've seen, one of the big challenges with these businesses is the fact that it is being invented as as each state goes, right? So, you know, Colorado made some big missteps with product labeling in the beginning. There are a lot of things that, you know, as this goes, people are sort of course correcting and realizing what needs to be done to keep consumers safe and educated. But I think that if you look overall, you haven't seen the negative impact that a lot of people predicted. And I think that, again, allowed this to become more normalized. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so you've named the book The New Chardonnay, and that's sort of what it's become now. Uh, That's exactly it. People like Martha Stewart that we trust to tell us, um, you know, what to have in our homes and what's acceptable to have on our tables. And people that not only lead in business, but like lead in music. And I think that it has a lot to do with people that we trust, celebrities. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, you talk about how he came onto CNN and said, I was wrong. You know, it kind of took all of these, all of these cultures meshing together to admit that we all sort of use it. Um, Nobody has died from it. We're all kind of interested in what more it could become. Um, And just that opening of the door and that really happened I think with people that were in the public eye like you talk about how Snoop Dogg has always used weed and it dawned on me how did that man get such good weed across the whole world when he was touring and it was illegal everywhere and it was the most fascinating part of the book to me was just to learn that like his manager just had the connections everything was underground and so this guy has a worldwide Rolodex of the best dealers in the world amazing Uh, But that is really how it started, like the connections between people and how people wanted to grow the industry and wanted to bring it above ground. You know, that's sort of the journey of the story of legalization. Um, And and you in your title allude to the fact that it's kind of the new, you know, it's the new way of getting home and relaxing. Now we don't sit with a glass of wine anymore. Um, Some people take an edible or tincture or they smoke a joint, you know, so what you're saying is that it's kind of becoming more acceptable for like soccer moms even. Well, I think what I was trying to say also, I wanted the audience to understand the rebranding and the people behind the rebranding. And so, you know, Beth deciding that 
she was going to make her dispensaries, you know, spa-like, a place that her mother would feel comfortable shopping in, this sort of making it very upscale and light. And I talked a little bit about MedMen. And I mean, I, I think the, the, the whole idea of how you rebrand this and present it to a new audience was really a theme I wanted to look at in the book. But I also found it so interesting personally, and this is another reason why it's called The New Chardonnay, was the while I was writing this, there was an incredible race to create the cannabis beverage of the future, which was Bruce Linton's dream. And now we're seeing the 